Thank you. I'll just give the panel a moment to, to sit down. Okay, we have an amazing title for this panel, The Plot Twist, The Next Chapter for Open Banking. Well, we have a blockbuster, just to keep with that narrative, um, the literary narrative, of a panel um, with us today. We've got Charlotte, John, Justin, and Jan. So lots of Jay, so I need to, to be on my, on my mark to keep it right for everybody. Okay, I want to jump straight in, if I may. Okay, so I would like us to start with some level setting, just to get um, the state of the nation, really, where we are now and where we're going to, um, to go in the future. And we've got a broad panel, so you're going to get quite a diverse perspective. So, John, um, you're very busy in Parliament. Do you want to tell us about your bill and what you're doing, please? I, I wish it was my bill, but it's, um, <laughs> it is, th there is a bill in Parliament. So, at the moment, all the success of open banking has been built on a single competition remedy which was put in place by the Competition and Markets Authority several years ago now. That's very nearly running to the end of its mandate. It's about to expire. We've got to replace it, not just with something for finance and banking, but actually for open data, smart data across the economy. That's what's called the DB, DPDI bill, which is sort of halfway through its uh, trek through Parliament at the moment. Um, and it does an awful lot of other things, but in the middle of it, there's about six or seven clauses, and they allow not just open banking and smart data in finance, they also allow open, um, uh, smart data across a whole range of other sectors too. And the, for me, at least, the really interesting, exciting, and you know, full of potential opportunity here is to try and take what has worked well in open banking, and you know, we've got a world-leading position for the moment, at least, in that, and say, why can't we clone that, roll it out across multiple other sectors? Why can't we do the same thing in open energy data, in open water data, in open online retailing data, in open health data, and on and on and on? And the point about it is that if you are somebody who is you know, in, in the open banking industry and you have a world-leading product and a world-leading position at the moment in the UK, um, we're mad if we don't try and use that as a way of cloning that across before the rest of the world gets there, and because there's an opportunity then for us to be the disruptor um, and the country that leads on all of that. So that's where we need to get to. The DBTI, DPDI bill is halfway through Parliament. Um, I'm probably the most impatient person in Parliament about it. I want us to move a lot faster, um, but that's where we are, and with any luck, it will come along just in time I'm saying this with my fingers firmly crossed, to take over and provide the extra powers which will be needed once the original set of legal powers created by the CMA finally expire. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a great opening. You mentioned there quite a few times about the UK leading, and we, we've spoken in Portcullis House about how we leverage that leadership position to um, allow UK business to capitalise upon it. I'd like to bring in Charlotte now. And Charlotte, if you could talk to us about the Open Banking Task Force, which was... Um, announced yesterday, and I know you've been working very hard behind the scenes, I believe that will have a big part to play in us retaining our voice on the global, if not international, stage. Thanks, Helen. And actually, the Open Finance Task Force. So I, do I, I try to. Sorry. Yeah, having I'm ingrained open yeah, banking. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Having chaired open yeah. banking for so long, I feel yeah. I never, <laughs> yeah, I'm never going to move out. Um, but yes, yeah, so you, what we've been you know, looking at and you know, working closely with industry is really looking at the potential, to, to John's point of what happens beyond the current competition mandate. Now, there's a lot to be done in open banking, and so you know, everyone says to me, why are you focusing on open finance? Why not complete, com, uh, continue on open banking? But that work's already in chain. Um, you know, obviously, JROC is leading on that and looking forward to seeing the next steps from them. But there is this big world, wor big world out uh, beyond that, and a lot of other hubs are looking at open finance. You know, and that's, again, if you look at the financial services journey that all of us face, it's, you know, it's a myriad of co you know, connectivity points we have across current accounts to savings and investments to pensions to mortgages and everything in between. And so CFIT has looked in the last nine months at what's the potential for open finance. And rather than try to conquer everything but not come up with any solutions, we took two proof points. One on SME financing, access to SME finance, which is a huge issue obviously across the country, and also for consumer credit and credit scores. Um, so the Open Finance Task Force announced yesterday by the Economic Secretary is giving us an opportunity to look at the one slice of that, which is SME lending, see if it will continue the work on the consumer side, um, and put recommendations into the Treasury 
that look at what can be done to make that easier, more accessible, and what data needs to be shared so we get more money to the right um, rightful owners of the companies. We're also going to take a piece of work on the commercial model of that because obviously we need to make sure that the suppliers of the data and the recipients of the data are duly incentivized to make sure innovation works. We're going to be talking a lot about the commercial model, but I just want to bring in um, Justin. We've got Justin and Jan, and um, Justin, I want him to talk about the data side, where we are in terms of data, like state of the nation, and then Jan to follow on and talk about the payment side, so beautifully complement each other. Over to you. Great, thanks, Helen. Yeah, lovely to be here. Um, I should first say, because I sit on the board of the CMA, so all of my <laughs> comments are my own. They don't represent <laughs> CMA policy at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we have really seen, obviously, tremendous growth, as um, John and Charlotte have talked about, in terms of making the data flow. Yeah. Um, it, the use cases are now myriad. I think there's, as we think about, and we'll talk later about the commercial model, it's slightly unclear whether in the uh, account information service provision area, whether there are direct profit pools that have been created, but there are certainly indirect ones. And so, um, you know, we now have, uh, you know, over one and a half million people who've given us access through open banking. We're doing millions of pools of data a day, and lenders are now starting to use that to underwrite. And what that means for consumers is it means that consumers that would have been um, not extended credit, can it be extended credit, right? And so, and do that safely because we can have a look at their, um, their bank account. And so that decisioning at the margin, as we call it, is becoming very, very important and is bringing people in who have been uh, difficult, have found credit difficult into the system. And that's a, a, a great use case. Now, I think generally the, the sort of direct consumer propositions like the personal financial management and things like that haven't really taken off as we would have thought. And I think if you look at the competition, the original order, which was really focused on trying to encourage current account switching, really, and competition between the CMA9, the main banks, actually that really hasn't changed that much. But what has happened, and we are a real leader in the uh, ecosystem that has been created, and Jan and I have talked a lot about the ecosystem, yeah. and I think con that continuation of growth, new companies disrupting, and if we can take that into open finance, I think that's going to be very, very exciting. Jan, do you want to just follow on there? Just a bit of scene setting around the payment side. Yeah? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, Justin, I agree with everything you said so far. It's, um, I, I think what has come out of the, out of the order and of course the, the revised payment services directive that was transposed here in the UK as the um, payment services regulations of 2017. Um, I mean, it really, it really inflated the, the, the fintech uh, bubble here in the UK, right? I think between 2018 and, and 2020, we saw, I mean, hundreds of new fintechs being, uh, being planted and all looking to uh, either use the data in, in, with indirect propositions um, to, to level the playing field with other financial institutions in, in, their, in their financial propositions, um, but also to introduce new competition in the payments markets. And, and one of the um, payment spaces you may have heard about before is pay by bank, for instance, right? It's a, essentially a payment initiation service where a regulated payment institution is authorized to, to um, submit a payment order on behalf of a, uh, on behalf of a, of a user to uh, ascending PSP. And, uh, and this proposition um, was, in, I mean, initially first enabled, I think, January 2018, but it took quite a while for that to sort of reach m uh, critical momentum with, with merchants. And I think by now, um, if I recall the latest statistics, we had about 14.4 um, million monthly payments uh, using this technology uh, last month. And um, I mean, we're, we're, reaching a, we're reaching a stage where I believe nearly one in six uh, UK consumers are using open banking technologies every single month. So this is sort of still growing as a, as a proposition. And at the same time, looking at the order, we have capabilities being introduced, such as sweeping, allowing users to automatically move funds between two accounts in the same name. And of course, commercial VRP, you know, one of the big hype terms, I think, of this year. 
uh, looking at how to use that automated money movement technology for merchant use cases. So I think there's a lot of um, momentum already in the open banking space, but a lot of more potential for innovation over the next couple of years. And what we find uh, um, at OBE with our audience, our global audience, is that people do look to the UK. They look to the UK for innovation, for ideas, and for us to, to lead that conversation. And what we've just heard there is around lending, which has got to be one of the, the biggest use cases, okay? second to HMRC, which I, I, I advise on, but obviously payments as well. And I really do think we are setting the pace to, to retain that global leadership position. So what I'd like to do is, I, I said that it was, you know, you agreed on things. I wanted to get to maybe a, a hotter topic and slightly more controversial. Um, but I'd like Charlotte to really position, because we are at a critical path with open banking. We've got future governance is being proposed. And what is the future commercial model of, of the entity, and particularly because we need to move at pace. And we've just heard Marion say that we're going to have the, the new the, the interim entity by the summer. So would you like for, you know, just to set the scene for everybody? Well, I'll try, and I'm not at OBL, so I will try to. I, hopefully I'll get it right, so apologies to my former colleagues if I get this wrong. But as I understand it, yeah, we obviously have the, what used to be called the Open Banking Implementation Entity, OBIE that's now being rebranded OBL, uh, Open Banking Limited, because it's not implementing. Anything beyond that, that's housing the order, um, the order being the competition and markets remedy. Um, anything beyond that is classed as non-order. So if anyone's not technical, I, I apologize. Um, and this is just an open banking. Right? Yep. So if you want to do anything beyond the order, it's quite tricky, because there's not actually an entity to do that, and the CMA not funding the entity. So the interim entity, the, the entity that uh, Marion's been outlining that's going to be set up by the summer, is able to house you know, things that aren't in the order so that they actually we can move forward um, at pace, as you say, um, and actually start to progress innovation. Because otherwise, we're going to be very limited on our narrow scope of open banking forever. Yeah. Um, so the interim entity can house that work so that can continue through 2024. And the task force that we'll be chairing will be effectively looking at that time frame as well, putting recommendations in by the summer as well. So it's all going to happen by the summer. Um, and then after that, obviously, eventually, there'll be a future entity. So interim entity becomes future entity. And that will be housing everything. And that's the work done by JROC, obviously, of what happens with the DPDI bill and the long-term regulatory framework. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. Um, and you know, the funding, the commercial model, the governance around that is obviously, you know, we're waiting for the regulators to give us more detail on that. So we really do need to lace up our trainers, don't we? Oh, that's fine. It's we fine do need to, need to lace up our We've trainers. We've got two months. It's fine. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get into um, a, li a little bit more detail now. Okay. Um, Justin, what's your read? And Com Bin, uh, Bim yesterday talked about um, you know, the commercial model. Um, we talked about the funding of the entity, but then there's a different, you know, that's the funding model, the commercial model. Can you really bring everybody up to speed and, you know, be as, as open and provocative as you would like to be um, at, around where we are and, and some of the current challenges that you will face as a, as a chief exec? Sure. Well, I think the, the first thing to say is that, I mean, I think I've never thought of open banking as you turn it on and then suddenly everybody will come. It's a slow-moving thing, which is incredibly powerful over time. It's more like a sort of glacier than it is like a fast-flowing river. And I think we're at the... My view is that we're sort of at the end of the beginning, right? And so I think we think, and, and, and a lot of us in the industry are sort of like we've been in this space for a very, very long time, but I think we are in a very, very early stage still. And we need to think extremely carefully as an industry, um, as uh, regulate, the regulators as well, into how this is going to develop. Um, and I think Charlotte did a very good job of representing where we are. But I think if, if, if the future of smart data is really to be fulfilled, the steps that we take over the next few years as we move into this next phase of open banking is going to be absolutely critical. And um, to be slightly controversial, you know, clearly the industry is being asked now to pay for the, um, uh, the, the, OBI, the, the next phase. 
Um, we've been asked to, you know, uh, give 2.75 million um, in a letter that some of you may have received. Uh, I certainly did. You know, with 48 hours notice to turn up to meetings, uh, with you know lines in there that says, well, this funding needs to be, uh, you know, delivered by the 1st of April. Um, when you're sent a letter on the 12th of March, doesn't feel particularly well managed to me. Okay. And so I think it's, it, it, I think the whole of the industry, all of us on this stage, I'm sure many of you in the audience today, we really want to see this succeed. Um, these, are very, these are very challenging discussions around the commercial model, where commercial models should be applied and not. My personal opinion is I do not think they should be applied in the account information service provision area. I think in payments, they definitely should. There's a debate to be had. I'm not saying I'm right. But I think what needs to happen is there needs to be much more engagement across the piece to really make sure that we can get it right. Otherwise, I worry that the, the potential is not going to be realized. I'm curious. I mean, Jan, I want to bring you in to get your comments. But you, you said you didn't think that um, data, the, the um, that, 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 that shouldn't be part of the, that shouldn't be paid for. Is that, yeah? I'm, I'm curious, does anybody on the panel have a view on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you, you, you were saying that payments should be competitive, yeah? And, and well, I think, you know, pay, um, open banking initiated payments is competing in a wide profit pool with yeah. many, many uh, payment providers. Yeah. Jan can tell us a lot more about that. Okay. Account information service provision, as I said before, there's no immediate profit pools that have yeah. been created from that, right? And so the idea that you go to a commercial model based on profits created mm -hmm. seems complex to me, right? Yeah. I think it should be much more focused on cost recovery and things like that, because obviously things need to be paid for. But yeah. all of these debates need to, be yeah. need to happen. Well, let's if start having the debate, debate here. Debate Jan, go for it. At this point, it's, um, I think it, it comes down to the fundamental rights on the GDPR Article 20, data portability, the right of a consumer data subject to transfer the data to a third party, and Article 6, the right to authorize uh, consent or provide uh, consent or contractual agreement for the processing of that data. And I think that the fundamental question is, do, should there be a commercial model? Can there be a commercial model that infringes on those inherent rights? And I think that's, that's potentially where you're coming from. Yeah. And one of the, one of the larger <laughs> ideas um, that has been playing around in, in the world of open banking, not just in the UK, but around the world, how do, we, how do we enable the industry to provide APIs, high quality services, yet at the same time not infringe on the inherent data rights a data subject a consumer has with regards to their own personal data. And I think there's been a lot of discussion in relation to one of the things we're going to be tackling as part of the Open Finance Task Force. John, please. Can, can I just follow up on that? Because I, I think t two thoughts um, occur, just taking the consumer's point of view for a second. First one is that people are not used to paying for their own data. They're much more used for it being free because it's their data um, and other people value it. So I think that will be a difficult conversation to have with consumers slash voters um, for either business people or politicians if that's where we end up. The second point I'd also make though is that um, to, to what we were just hearing from Justin, um, I think that it's clear that this, the use cases are changing all the time. They are maturing all the time. They're developing all the time. Any kind of you know, business model that locks in one set of use cases and says these ones work and those ones don't is likely to be wrong within 18 months, certainly within five years. So whatever we come up with has got to allow for this thing to be, re to be future proof and rethought and, and move with it um, you know, on a regular basis because whatever we think we know now will be wrong. Mm. That's a great point, John. You're not you're nodding your head. No, abs absolutely. I mean, this is this is obviously in, in transition, and I think um, uh, the the policymakers are well aware of. Uh, of all the uh, the interplay with uh, with different regulations, um, but I think it's um, when talking about commercial models, it's one of the general concerns that um, account information service providers or those who are leveraging the data to create indirect value for 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 consumers are considering. Now, in the payment space, there's been there's been uh, a lot more controversy, I think, because I think there is a, a general um, uh, perception that there is no fair distribution of risk, investment risk, and investment reward 
in the payments ecosystem. Uh, and that is because the financial institutions are uh, not only required to provide their APIs, but also required to maintain the infrastructure and the connectivity to the central bank and the F and FPS and Pay UK to run the faster payment system. Um, and they're not seeing any return from, from those investments. And I think that, that was one of the intentions for the commercial VRP model. Um, was to int introduce a, um, uh, uh, basically some type of ROI for financial institutions. The question is, is whether that's going to jeopardize or going to uh, challenge existing pay-by-bank propositions. Um, and if there are any other opportunities also beyond maybe CVRP um, to en enrich the payment experiences for both consumers and merchants. And I think that is one of the, the areas where increased competition and more commercial models can emerge. We could talk about this topic all day. It's something very close to my heart, having uh, run a card issuing bank. I'm curious, um, and I'm mindful of time, how do we make the payments model commercially viable? So it, open banking payments is ubiquitous. Mm. Um, in, a, in a couple of sentences, if you would. I think there have been uh, already a couple efforts in the market yeah. that have uh, exemplified this. Um, there are, of course, bilateral agreements that have already been established. Um, the regulator is proposing a potential uh, mandated scheme, and uh, I believe there are also um, other initiatives in the works under some of the trade associations in order to, to facilitate a framework for, for a commercial model. So I believe that it's only a matter of, uh, of time before, before that gets established and gets momentum within the market. Just as we, um, as we sort of draw it to a close, over all too fast, um, Justin, you must have something more to say on making the commercial model viable, surely. Well, I think, you know, it needs to be, um, you know, I agree with John, flexibility is really, really going to be very important. Um, I just hope that we, I hope, what, there are three hopes I have. The first is that all of us in the industry, and many of you will have a lot of opinions in this room, you need to get involved, right? So if you don't know what JROC is, if you don't know what the implementation, um, the um, o OB uh, Limited is all about, right? Reach out and start to get involved. We need to get many more voices, I think, around that table. Um, the, the, the second thing is that, you know, I think it's really important that we don't rush it. So this whole thing of like, we've got to get it done by the summer, da, 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 really, really worries me. Given that there's, you know, a general election on the horizon, right, I think probably this time next year we'll still be talking about a lot of these things. And that's probably not a bad thing as long as there is clarity on how we're going to get them resolved. John, would you like to say anything? I'm, I'm just, just shifting curious. slightly uncomfortably in my seat there because, um, <laughs> yes, there's a general election on the horizon, but you know, we are not alone in this. We currently have a, a, a leading position internationally, but there are an awful lot of other countries who want to eat our lunch. Uh, um, so so we, we have to move. I mean, I take your point. If we rush it and we get it wrong, that'll be disastrous, but we have to move really quickly because otherwise we're going to get overtaken. And, and there are a couple of things that just need to be delivered. It, it needs to be either cheap or cheaper or ideally free to consumers. It's got to save them time, will be more convenient, and um, it's got to be safer. If you can get some combination of those, and extra access actually for people who are currently dis um, disenfranchised, if you can get some combination of those four fast, then we're in a real sweet spot. Good point, well made. We are coming to the last um, couple of, uh, well, sort of minute, just over, under a minute. I wanted every member of the panel, this is the, the plot twist, okay, the next chapter. So when we convene here again next year, what will we be talking about in a couple of words? John. Uh, the, the first examples of multilateral frameworks for uh, fair distribution of risk and reward. Oh, fantastic. Oh, we're going to get competitive. Beat that, Justin. Come on. Uh, I hope we're talking about the clear uh, direction for the future based on, a set of, uh, based on a set of rules that are fair and compelling. John? I, I hope we're going to say that, that not only is open banking established and clearly you know, even more of a success, but also the first of the other sectors, energy, water, whichever one it is, um, has been successfully begun and is starting its rollout too. Charlotte, wrap it up. What, what are we going to be talking about, please? I'll say a few it, things. It's, it's, it's time for an implementation timeline now. Um, as you said, we have to think carefully on that. Implementation in itself is, requires governance and tricky conversations. But I think we've been talking about the theory of this now. Mm. It's now time to move to the next phase. Yeah. Yeah. 
what a panel. What I would love us all to be talking about this year when we meet again is that the UK is leading in uh, this conversation. We see it at OBE um, with people tuning in from around the world. And uh, we're about to launch our um, uh, transatlantic index, which is showcasing the best of the UK and how we can use our experience and support the growth in America and vice versa. A, um, American companies com coming over here because we've got something called 1033 that's happening in the States and that it creates a huge opportunity for the UK. Why? Because as everybody has said here, we really do lead this conversation. So I look very, very much forward to seeing you. I've got my tongue tied there, didn't I? I look forward to seeing you all again next year and thank you uh, to uh, you for listening and the panel for sharing their insight. Can you please give them a huge round of applause? You're welcome. <laughs> That's great.